Hey everybody, it's Jason McLaren. Welcome to my free training on introduction to leadership. Thanks for joining me and I just want to give you some value here and let you know what's going on. So first we're going to talk about our objectives. We're going to identify the roles of a frontline leader, functions of management, and some of the policies and regulations that you may see as a frontline leader. First we're going to talk about frontline leader responsibilities. So as a leader you're going to be a supervisor and a leader, right? Uh, you may be responsible for managing a budget for your department or maybe a division depending on how your organization's uh, changed up and uh, You may be responsible for understanding your customer or client. Actually, that's something you're going to be responsible for You've got you're gonna have to know your policies and procedures and be able to manage daily tasks And we'll talk about this a lot more in depth as we go through the training on what what all this entails so understanding your product or service. Obviously, if you're in a leadership role, uh, you're going to be the one that your subordinates are coming to when they don't know what's going on. And you also need to know your laws, ordinances, codes, uh, because especially if you're in like a service industry, there's a lot of regulation on that. And so you want to make sure you know what's going on. You also want to know your technology, uh, any kind of systems you use in the organization. And this can even be non-computer related just because it says technology does not mean that it's on the computer. It could be a paperwork system that your company has, uh, some kind of uh, uh, other procedures you guys do. And we'll talk about that some more. So as a leader, you're gonna be supervising a small group of people, right? Usually, uh, we'll talk about this some more as a, in span of control, but um, you're gonna supervise a small group of people or a division depending on your company, once again. And then you're gonna achieve your goals by working through your subordinates. Most frontline leaders, uh, they're there to make sure that the subordinates are uh, performing the, the goals or achieving the goals that they're set forth. Doesn't mean you're not a working supervisor. You could still be a working supervisor and a leader, but uh, you're going to work through your subordinates. And then you're obviously multi uh, prioritizing multiple demands. Uh, this is when you're getting to that role where you're going to have a lot of tasks coming up and you're, it's going to be your job to make sure those tasks are organized. And we'll talk about that some more also. So some of the administrative duties that you could be responsible for. So keeping records, uh, managing projects, preparing budgets, and maintaining maintenance requisitions, and conducting preliminary investigations. So let's start, let's break these down a little bit. Keeping records. This could be as simple as timesheets. Maybe you're in charge of making sure your people are coming to work on time and you've got to keep the timesheets uh, recorded and tracked. Because one, what is that going to do? That's going to leave see if your people get paid for the for the two weeks, right? Uh, managing projects, you may think I'm never going to manage a project. This could be as simple as, uh, say, you work at a restaurant and <clears throat> and you're in charge of making sure deliveries are organized. You know that truck backing in and getting that those supplies where they go. That's a project, right? Uh, budget request, you may not be you know at that level where you're actually controlling a budget, but anyone in the level of uh, the organization should be providing some kind of input on budget requests. Maybe not the very frontline people, but once you make it into that supervi supervisor uh, advisory role, uh, you can provide input on budget requests. Uh, you know, talk to your supervisor about, hey, uh, these are some things we may need to look at funding for the next couple years. Uh, maintenance requests. If you're a frontline person and you're in charge of a building at any time by yourself, or you're, you know, maybe you and one other staff member, you may have to manage a maintenance request. And I'm sure that there are procedures there uh, by your CEO or anybody that's uh, depending on the size of your organization on how to do that. And then the prelim preliminary investigations. Why you, when you see that, you might think investigation. That's serious, right? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be. This could be as simple as hey, this employee didn't get paid for an hour or two that they were supposed to get paid for. You're going to do a preliminary, quote, investigation on, hey, did they really work those hours or, you know, are they trying to scam the system? Then you provide that to the person that actually does the payroll or is the next person up that can change that or make those changes. All right, so supervisory duties. And we talked about supervising a team of a group or a team. Uh, that's just what it is, right? You're gonna be supervising uh, a number of people and delegating those work assignments. Once again, you're trying to get to a goal uh, at the end of the day or end of the, the period on whatever uh, schedule you're on. 
and then you're managing tier one, I call it tier one quality control. So as a frontline supervisor, if you're working in an area, you're gonna be the one that makes sure that the job is done to the satisfaction of not only the company, but the customer or the client, depending on what you do. Uh, and I speak in generalities here because there's a bunch of different uh, organizations. So for example, in that tier one quality control, we'll use a uh, fast food restaurant, for example. That manager is there to make sure that that uh, burger goes out the same way at every location. Uh, it's up to the frontline personnel to make the burger, but that manager, it's ultimately up to that person to make sure it's made with the right, right quality ingredients in the right way. Uh, continuing on, uh, ensuring regulatory procedures are followed. Once again, we'll use our fast food example. Simple regulatory procedures, hand washing, you know, disinfecting, that sort of thing. Making sure food temperatures are, are the right temperature. That's all procedures that need to be followed and there's gotta be someone there that's the leader to make sure all that is gonna happen. Then there's always the additional duties and uh, you, got, you can provide input on processes or procedures. I mentioned that earlier with the budgets, but also if you see a way uh, something that's going on, hey, this isn't working quite as well as we thought it would, you can always put in some input on that, bump it up the chain, hopefully make that a better process. You provide frontline training. So once you've moved up to that next level, you're usually gonna be providing training to the people below you. So that usually is the job that you used to have or the job that you've been trained on how to train someone else for. The way I train this class right now, I've been through dozens of different trainings and I, that I've learned that these skills from those trainings, I've learned these skills from leading people. I've learned these skills from being in that position. So that's why I'm training you right now. This is a frontline training. Uh, responding to customer inquiries. So everyone has a customer. Even if you're in a service industry or a product industry, you have customers or clients, depending on what you're doing. The frontline leader is gonna be the one that responds to those inquiries first, right? Uh, this could be a, if you're doing a product and you sell a product and you ship that product to someone, they're not happy with it, they're gonna call the number, right? On your website or on your product packaging and they're gonna ask for assistance. Usually they're gonna get a call center. Well, if th that person that answers the phone is not uh, meeting that customer's need, it's up to that frontline supervisor, frontline leader to respond to that inquiry. Then you always have the quote unquote other duties as assigned. This is a bullet point you start to see on a lot of job descriptions, and that's so that companies can task you with different things throughout your career. It's not always bad. I, when I first started seeing this on my job description, I thought, this is not good, I don't wanna do this. But other duties as assigned can get you out of your comfort zone and give you more skills and skills that you're able to leverage on your resume uh, for future roles. All right, now let's talk about organizational structure. This is another module here. So in an organization, you have a hierarchy. And this picture here shows you a, a really slim example of a hierarchy or organizational chart or a chain of command, depending on what your company does. If you're in the government sector, it's usually a chain of command. If you're in a real, really organized corporate sector, you're gonna have an organizational chart. This creates structure for managing an organization and direction of operations. Anywhere you work, if you have more than five, 10 people, you've got some kind of organizational chart. And that's because there has to be somebody in charge of something, right? You have to have somebody directing the operations or directing specific uh, tasks that need to be accomplished. And so that's how this is all created. The titles, they may vary by the organization, but it's the concept's usually the same. You may see a title uh, executive director at one place and they may be called a CEO at another place depending on what the company does. Or you may see a, a chief operations officer at one place or, or vice president of operations at another. Probably doing the same kind of work, just a different title. And this is a uniform style of leadership. Like I said, you will see this at any major company. They have organizational charts. Any major government organization has chain of command. Uh, they have this hierarchy because it works. It's a uniform style of leadership. And it's based on four basic principles here. And it's, and it's unity, span of control, division of labor and discipline, which we'll talk about some more. So unity, uh, this kind of comes from the military and fire service 
and uh, those governmental type agencies, but each team member only has one supervisor. If your organization is set up, cor uh, not correctly, but set up efficiently, your team, each member only has one supervisor. That should be the person that's on their uh, performance review or on their uh, paycheck as their supervisor. Uh, I know for me, where I work full time, I have I can log into this system and I see who my direct supervisor is. And I think they actually link it to email now. You can go into my email and see who my, my supervisor is and who their supervisor is. Everybody only has one supervisor. That's who you go for questions or for job tasks. Each supervisor only answers to one person. Once again, that person above you should only answer to one person. That should be their go-to for task and goals and any kind of questions like that. And then now that kind of reverts back. You have a direct route of responsibility from the CEO or the corporate president, whatever the title is. It could be executive director, um, anything like that, to the front line. And if you look at uh, companies that are on the forefront of these Unity, they actually flip it and they have an inverted hierarchy where the direct route of responsibility leads to the lead of the organization. So if you see the, on the picture here, the red, blue, and green square are leading directly to the corporate leader. And so it's kind of an inverted hierarchy. Span of control, this kind of goes back to that. Everyone has one leader or one person over them, but also that person can't run everybody, right? So you can't just have like one CEO and 100 people under them. You have a maximum number of personnel that are activities that one individual can control, and that's usually three to seven. That's been the generally accepted number throughout uh, professional organizations and the military. If you look at the military, uh, you have an element leader, which is the first leader in a group, and it's usually five to seven uh, uh, soldiers or airmen or whatever the organization is underneath that person. Then you have a flight leader or squadron leader, depending on what the, what uh, uh, branch of the military you're in uh, so it goes up from there and then so then you have four or five squad leaders per flight and then you have uh, you know four or five flights per battalion you know, I'm probably but butchering and all my military people are going to say I'm an idiot but anyway that's kind of the gist of it then you have division of labor. This is a way of organizing a workload and it breaks down the overall strategy into smaller tasks and prevents duplication of efforts. The best example of this is an assembly line or as you see in the picture here, this food, uh, the food line. You've got one guy doing mashed potatoes, one guy doing a side, one guy doing a meat. And this makes sure that nobody is duplicating efforts and you're not having multiple people trying to do the same thing and people aren't stepping over each other. This is why restaurants use this procedure very often. You'll see uh, one person doing one thing, the next person doing the next, and they kind of have a workflow, and that's why fast food restaurants are successful. Then you have discipline. This is a, a task assignment by a supervisor or a standard operating procedure or operating guideline or policy. We'll talk about some more of these in a little bit, but this discipline is these procedures and policies are put in place or these tasks are put in place uh, for a reason, right? There's something that's happened. So these these disciplines can be positive. So a standard procedure is a positive because it's there, something happened in the past or they found out a better way to do this that it's gonna make your job easier or make your job safer. Uh, or it could be corrective. This may be a task by a supervisor that says, hey, uh, can you do this this way? It's, the way you're doing it's not gonna work. We need to correct that. Uh, and then you have other areas of an organization. This can be by function, geography, or staffing. And you see this in really large, you know, national, international companies where you have, you know, a function maybe, okay, this is our function, uh, this is our sales team. You have an, that's an organization. Or you have geography. They may have a, a regional director in a region of the restaurant or the company. And then you have by staffing, okay, these are our, uh, executive team and these are our marketing team you know it could be broken down by that that could be uh, another division of the hierarchy that rolls up now let's talk about functions of management so functions of management you got planning which is developing a program or method to accomplish an objective so this you pretty much everybody does this every day I'm sure when you wake up you don't just go 
and guess what you're going to do for the day. You plan your day out. You're going to develop a, a plan for the day to accomplish your objectives. Hey, okay, today I need to make sure that this package gets shipped out. So what do I need to do? I need to buy a stamp I need, or I need to get my stamps. I need to write the address on there. I need to get the address. It's a plan for a simple, uh, that's a simple objective. Now as a leader, you're going to have objectives that you have to accomplish on a bigger scale. So you're going to have to plan a little bit better. And then you, so then you're going to get into organize, organizing. That's putting your resources together into an orderly, functional, structured format. So hopefully you've had policies and procedures, training, and you're able to organize and plan for your day or your shift or your month, whatever your timeline is for your goals, and make sure that all those resources and plans are put together to meet that goal. Then you have leading and controlling. So leading is just what it says. We've been talking about this this whole class. You're guiding or directing a course of action. You're going to put that planning and organization into practice, guide your team, make sure that they're on the way to meet that goal. And then controlling, restraining, regulating, governing, or counteracting. When you see this, you might think that that's a negative. Once again, this could be a positive, a positive control, either restraining or regulating uh, a task. You know, you can't say, okay, we need to build this building in 12 hours and expect your guys to overwork themselves, violate safety rules, and uh, you know, generally do unaccepted practices to meet that goal. That's not a a regulated control. You need to control that process and make sure that it's safe. Then you have rules and regulations. So we, this was talked about earlier. We're developing, these are rules and regulations are developed by a government or government authorized organization. You see this everywhere, right? No room for latitude or discretion. These are things, these are black and white. Well, one example I have on here is wearing a seat belt when riding in a vehicle. There's no gray, on that. You're either wearing it or you're not wearing it, right? There should be no reason you're not wearing it because it's a law. Uh, there's a lot of laws that apply to companies, businesses. Uh, you want to make sure that those rules and regulations are followed and that you're, as a frontline leader, enforcing those rules and laws. Then you have policies. These are pro provide guidelines for present and future actions. Like I said earlier, policies are written for a reason. Something happened, something, a best practice happened, so they wrote a policy on it. Somebody wrote a policy. These often require judgment or the, on the best course of action when done that policy. One example, and I've used this a lot, is cell phones at uh, cell phone use at work. Generally, if you're in a frontline position, you're not allowed to use your cell phone at work. You see this at restaurants, at uh, shopping stores. Uh, I worked in a uh, a 911 center. We were not allowed to have our cell phone on us at the time. I think they've changed it since then, which probably went into that precursor about requiring judgment on the best course of action. You could always, when it, even when you weren't allowed to have your cell phone, you could always ask the supervisor, hey, my kid's sick and they might need me for something. Can I have my cell phone on me so they can call me? Usually the supervisor would say yes. Once again, that's the best course of action within the policy. Uh, that wasn't written in the policy that you could have it if your kid was sick, but it's up to the leader at that time to make that discretion. Then you have standard operating procedures. These are written organizational directives that establish routine methods to follow for designated operations or actions. They're developed within the organization. These are not rules or, or regulations like laws. These are developed by the organization. The difference in these standard operating procedures and a policy is that this is a process. A policy is a action, right? It's something that you can or can't do. Procedure is what you have to do. And so, for example, it's a process for evacuating in case of emergency. Pretty much every big organization, medium or big organization, is going to have a process for evacuating emergency. Actually, I'd say every, or every organization because even you should have one for your house, a, a process for evacuating emergency. But even small businesses usually have to have a fire response plan or fire evacuation plan per the fire marshal or whoever for their certificate of occupancy. So that's a very good example of a standard operating procedure. That's a procedure that's written and everyone should know it and everyone should follow it if that needs to be, uh, if that needs to happen. And we're, we'll talk about ethics now. So most of the time leaders make right ethical decisions that are the right decision. 
When unethical choices are made, the negative consequences are felt for the individual and the organization. We see this all the time. This is huge in the political sector, the entertainment industry. Uh, people make wrong decisions and they get blasted for it. And that kind of leads into our next slide here. To make ethical choices, you want to have a code for your company. You want to have a code of ethics. So most you see this in a lot of companies. They have ethics. Uh, they only hire employees that share the ethics. Usually you have to sign some kind of form when you get hired on that you're going to follow those ethical bylaws or, or the code of value, uh, uh, core values. And you want to ensure your leaders are exhibiting the ethical behavior. You don't want to have a leader that is out there uh, not doing the right thing because everyone's going to see that, right? Uh, so ensure your leaders are exhibiting ethical, ethical behavior. Having clear job goals. That goes back to my example earlier about having the guys work late. You know, make sure your goals are established and that you're following ethical guidelines. You want to make sure that you're paying people overtime when they work overtime. You want to make sure that you're not making people work uh, longer hours than they're allowed to. Uh, you see this sometimes in the trucking industry. They're only allowed to drive a certain amount of hours, but they will... Uh, I've heard of them changing, you know, having separate logbooks so that they can drive more hours. Not very ethical, uh, but the job goal is to get things where they need to go. You want to have performance appraisals. You want to make sure that people are getting graded every year on their performance. Uh, this allows them to see where they need to improve or where they're, uh, or where they're performing well. And... Uh, you want to implement an ethics training program. That kind of goes into all this. Make sure that everyone is on the team. Everyone's uh, playing by the rules and going to follow the rules and so that they know what, they, what is expected of them. So three questions someone should ask if they're questioning an ethical decision. What would my family and friends say if they knew? Uh, this is a, a, a no-brainer, right? What would my family and friends say if they knew what I was doing right now, you know? If, I, if you're an uh, employee and you're taking money out of the cash register or you're taking money out of the drop bag that you're supposed to be as a leader taking to the bank at night, uh, what would your family and friends say? Would you, mind, uh, would you mind if a paper ran your headline as a story? You know, what are you doing? Um, let's say you're, you're swapping out a, a product for a cheaper product that you're, you're advertising, you know, differently. Uh, that's not a very good story, right? Not going to be a good headline. And then how does it make you feel about yourself? You know, you want to feel good at the end of the day. You don't want to make a decision that's going to be unethical to where you're going to feel like crud the rest of the day or the rest of your career. So in review, uh, at, at the frontline leadership level, level, the emphasis is placed on accomplishing goals and objectives through your subordinates. Like I said, you're there to lead people. You're not there to be the worker bee anymore. You may be a working supervisor. Don't forget, you may be a working supervisor but it's not your job to be the frontline guy. Uh, you want to apply policies and procedures through to your subordinates. You want to make sure everyone's following the rules. Don't play favorites. Don't say, okay, this guy can do this, but this guy can't. Uh, the hierarchy is going to create your structure. You should know who's above you and who's below you and who's several levels above you so that you're able to manage effectively. Don't forget the four functions of managing, planning, organization, leading, and controlling. And then leaders must know the regulation, regulations and policies, make sure that you're enforcing them and make sure that you're not breaking them, which leads into making ethical choices based on your values. Finally, leaders must match each individual strength with the needs of the organization. Make sure that your leaders and your subordinates all have the strengths that are going to make them excel within the organization and they uh, are able to be more successful in their goals. So with that, this is Jason McLaren with jasonmclaren.info. Lead on.